This is certainly not a moment for panic or high anxiety. It is a moment for vigilance. I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United this States. This particular case could be the first possible instance of community transmission of COVID-19 in the United States. A public health emergency. A declaration of emergency. State of emergency. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. This is truly an unprecedented situation. This virus doesn't discriminate. It attacks everyone. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. Unprecedented, it's unlike anything that, that I've ever been through before in a lot of ways, so. You do get spoiled and you do get caught up in, okay, well, just assuming that all these things are gonna happen and now you enter a year where there was no assuming anything's gonna happen. You know, everything kind of started shutting down. NBA was done, the March Madness was done. Everything was just getting delayed. It became pretty clear things were turning when we were, we were actually, it was over spring break, we had gone to Omaha with my family and state basketball was going on, or about to go on, and, and all of a sudden it's, you know, it's no fans and you're like, whoa, this is actually, this is happening. You know, the world is gonna be different. baseball tryouts and then after right before the next practice we got a text saying that school was going virtual and we couldn't play baseball anymore. I wasn't sure if we were going to get a season at all. I knew that the NSA was gonna come out with some guidelines. I wanted to be ahead of the curve. I also wanted to convince our administrators we could do this. I worked for a long time on a plan for summer training that incorporated three different sites so we could go 10 at a time, transitions of different coaches supervising and, and trying to welcome Coach Doyle in, brand new. First day was the first day of training. You know, I'd only been in town a day and a half trying to move his family in, so I knew I had to be ahead of the curve, and I felt like if we had a successful summer, then we'd have a chance at being able to play. It was tough. I mean, even my dad, like, we talked about even going to a smaller school for just, like, the fall season. First of all, we didn't know we were going to have a season. And then once we did, we had to adapt to all these restrictions. As a staff, we're all first-year coaches again because you don't, you don't have a script for it. I don't know, I was just in shock, honestly. I, I don't know, I, I didn't know how to describe it. We just got all the news from the coaches and they were like, this is what we want you guys to do. You take a bunch of veterans that can walk into June or July and, and you're just fine tuning and now all of a sudden it's, it's from scratch. During the shutdown uh, and Zooming with kids, you know, We'd have offensive groups one day, defensive groups the next day. We'd have seniors just trying to keep them engaged. And as, it, as the spring wore on, it became very apparent that I hope we even have a season. I was thinking about it for like a week straight because, I mean, we didn't know. The coaches didn't know. Parents didn't know. Like middle schools couldn't do sports, so I was like kind of thinking we were next. Yeah, most definitely had my doubts that we were going to have a season because of all this COVID protocol that we had. It could change by the hour, you know, at times where we would, we would plan something for the next day and then be told, you know, oh, we can't do that or, or yes, you can do this. I don't know, it was just crazy. You know, one day you had a plan and, and the next morning you'd come in and say, okay, this person or this, this thing has changed. 
Uh, so you adjust on the fly. So you really, really had to be flexible as far as uh, planning ahead and have multiple, you know, plan A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> A lot of scrambling after resources to help kids out, um, you know, trying to see if kids could get some workouts in. And It was probably a good three or four week preparation and logistics and a lot of things had to come together and a lot of people had a hand in it. Behind the scenes, there was a ton of meetings. There were a ton of conferences, <laughs> a ton of Zoom calls, emails. Um, yeah, it, it, it took a lot to get it going. It really was one of those just kind of stay with what's right in front of you, stay on today and um, just do the best you can with it. There's a lot of angst in the in the spring and and I could feel what the kids were feeling too and coaching staff was unsure and even if you do everything the way it's supposed to be done there's a chance somebody might say well sorry when I think back to when I played just having the being on the brink of having your senior year taken away I mean man it's gut-wrenching you just gotta try and keep everyone positive and keeping that idea that we're going to end up playing the whole way through. So we were talking as a senior group, okay, what can we do to stay safe with COVID, still get the gains we want to get, and still prepare for the season ahead? No one was excited about the mass, but we wanted to play football so bad. We were willing to do whatever it takes. I remember a huge part of it was having to be really detailed with the masks, and then we had to work out outside of organized things, so we had to get into small groups, go to parks and do conditioning stuff and get any training we could in. We would make group chats of our platoons, so we would text each other in those to make sure people are doing their, their workouts, getting their stuff done. Coaches were sending us workouts like do curls with milk jugs or bench press your couch I mean it was bizarre figured out how to do you know like body weight workouts and, and things like that um, meeting online um, talking as a staff about what we can do out of it and I mean I guess the weirdest thing I did was I used our our piano bench as a like a bench press for dumbbell bench but and it's not it's like this long too so I got like half my body hanging off of it before the summer, we weren't really, we couldn't lift like at the school. So we had to find ways to get everybody lifting and working out. And then that translating into working out in my friend's shed just to try to keep up with where I knew I was supposed to be at and where we were all supposed to be at. It's all cool to have everybody in the group because we're all doing the same thing. But when people are in their house, they're gonna be more comfortable, more relaxed make sure we're all keeping each other accountable was the biggest part. There's definitely times where you didn't know if you were going to end up playing the whole season. The early part was definitely challenging in terms of just, I mean, it was tough for everyone to kind of get into what we were doing because we didn't know if we were even going to get to do it. I think we all had that in the back of our heads, but we were trying to ignore it. That's why we kept ourselves busy. There was definitely times where we could all get frustrated by the situation that we were thrown into. Zoom call push-ups and I'd go out in my garage. We just do that for hours, trying to keep ourselves busy, not thinking about possibility not having a season. But that just goes back to what we've been taught since we were about this big, that uh, our factor that Coach T's been instilling in us, um, just respond. We have a lot of respect as a program for history. And I think one of the things that we got from that that was really nice was our kids understood that we've had some, there's been kids walk these halls that had to deal with, you know, world wars, um, some pretty big stuff. So having to wear a mask and, and spray down the lockers, yeah, it's tough, but I mean, it's not, it's not anything that we can't respond to. And especially when it first hit, we were just, you know, cause you do, you slip into this anger, uh, why us, you know, and then quickly, and Coach T obviously is big on this. It's just like a Friday night, you gotta respond. And I think within the first 72 hours, we realized, okay, now what? I never thought I'd be doing this. Is this part of a coaching job? Uh, as an athletic trainer, I never thought I'd be doing what I was, you know, the stuff that we'd be doing either. My staff in particular went above and beyond doing way more than they've ever been asked to do in the summer as far as strength and conditioning so our kids could have that chance. You know, at times it was, I would say, a little daunting to continue to try to 
tell these kids something that they could put their faith in, but really not being able to have any backing to it. Coach T came out and told us what the game plan was and what we had to do in order to have a season. I know who I'm coached by and I know that we can get the job done. We all just stepped up, did what we needed to do. And thankfully we had Coach T's help and all this coaches help and we just pushed through everything. Ryan, how are you? I'm good. Well, what's funny good is, go. Yosh. Morning. <laughs> Yosh, are you alive? Do you have a pulse? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> CPR on Yosh. Good job. Couple things on, on the mask. As you notice, all the coaches, Jeremy, uh, we're all masked. We're, we're mandatory masked every place, anytime, anywhere. Coaching staff, support staff, we'll have to wear them on the sideline, in the locker room, in school. Our new world is just masks all the time. That's going to be very close to what you guys have. So don't ever report without a mask. Got to have it. Okay, that's just the, the situation that we're in, and that's the necessary steps we got to take to protect each other. That's what we're going to do, right? Whatever it takes to get on this field and play together and get us opportunities to compete, we'll do it. So when we're done conditioning, those mask guys go right back on. Okay? I know you're just changing your shoes down there. They go right back on, all right? We, we're on all the time. And I know part of it is the appearance thing, but I think, you know, a lot of it is just, if we get that barrier, the more we have that barrier on, the better chance we have of protecting ourselves and that that's the way it'll be, okay? Everybody kind of understand that. So tomorrow we start in the weight room. So you'll just, we'll do masks and temperatures just like always in the weight room. That's where you'll report first and then we'll come out here and and we'll do our conditioning. Make the most out of it, do the best you can, give it your all and go get it. Find a way. Drew man, what's up? Camera. Yeah. Sneak peek. Drive it on the rim. It's me, can you? Zoom in, it's got Cheeto dust all over it. And I forgot to take it off when I had breakfast this morning, so it's a little dirty. The summer was nothing like before. I mean, we were split up into like 12 groups. I mean, I had like, I don't even know, 10 people in my group. It was crazy. Like in the weight room, we were like every other rack by ourselves. Like it was, it was way different. As football programs go, we might have been hurt worse by this than maybe anyone other than the teams that just didn't get to play at all because, because of how much we rely on April and May and June 
to do what we do every fall. I think our bond as a team, it was rocky at the start because we didn't really have that time in the off season to like, you know, be with, be with everybody, lift together. We were only able, like I said, to only have 10, 15 guys together at a time. And that just made that bonding like, it was tough. We didn't spend as, uh, enough time with each other with not having spring, with our summer being all split up with COVID. Probably just wasn't as tight as a team as we should have been. I think what we learned is there's some intangibles about working out together as a team. It really does, it's not about moving the weight. It's not about doing, you know, a piece of paper that has these weights and sets on it. It really is about being in a room together. It is about pushing each other, um, accountability, you know, doing your work before the sun is up. And I think without those things, uh, what we try to get accomplished really can't be done in, in a quarantine format. It just There's too many things missing um, that go above and beyond just actually lifting weight or running or any of those things. There's a small margin for error, you know, was to have the su success in Class A football because there's a lot of great teams. When you have that little margin of difference, we kind of saw a, f a few points in the season where it really showed where uh, you know, a loss can turn into a win or vice versa. I mean, this was a great uh, eye-opener for all of us as a staff, as a program, that, um, you know, the things we do in the off-season, the things we, the, we ask the kids to do, um, you know, they might only add up to four or five plays. Uh, that's a whole season. The things that we were lacking, uh, that is our secret ingredient. I think overall, caution was on the minds of everyone that made the decisions. Some were more cautious than others. It's easy to have an idea about a different way to do things, but ultimately safety first was the rule. And safety first was the primary basis for every decision made. Eventually it got taken care of properly. Uh, eventually the games were played. You still see restrictions continue beyond into other seasons, but for football, that was the trial run. And so caution was going to rule, and you just we had to abide by that too. I had my doubts on on would we be able to play? Would the NSA even clear us to play? And if the NFS, NSAA came out and said, "Hey, these are the guidelines you get to play," would our school district buy into it? I didn't even know that. Would our would our Central Nebraska Health Department buy into it? Would we be out here a week and then be shut down? And I think our kids felt like that and the coaches the whole time. And we constantly talked about, hey, let's make the most of this day. We don't know if there's gonna be a next week. I think gratitude is taken for granted. I think people sometimes aren't willing to share that gratitude. There's an expectation. Uh, there's almost a level of entitlement and I think we've all learned that that can disappear in a sniff. That balance helped a lot in terms of not slipping into like self-pity. Um, and that's why I keep coming back to the, the level of gratitude the boys had and the coaches, because we could just, like I said, look down to Omaha and realize, well, those kids just, they're done. So yeah, we might have to do this, do that. And, and kids started, I think kids started focusing on what they had instead of what they didn't have. Our kids, like every year, did everything that was asked and more, and with a higher degree of difficulty. I can't say enough about how the kids handled it from doing everything perfect. Having the perspective and, and uh, the ability to, to be kind of tunnel visioned on, on getting this thing done. Back in January and February, Coach Tika sat all seniors down and said, all right, it's time to come up with your theme. So, you know, we spent probably a month, month and a half, and we finalized it to find a way to make a way. We finalized that right before we left for spring break, and then the whole world went I'm definitely taking that motto and applying that to the rest of my life. You know, find a way to make a way, because that's what this season was all about. Kids respond to things like this a lot better than adults in a lot of cases, I think. Our kids were amazing as far as they didn't ever make an excuse along the way. At least I never heard an excuse. They just said, what can we do? And... We told them what, we, what they could do and they did it. Let's just focus on what we control and let's focus on today. Let's focus on what's right in front of us. That was really put to the test because you had to. There was no game three. There was no game four. There was Tuesday. So let's get better on Tuesday. Let's enjoy Tuesday. The next day it was like, hey, 
they haven't called it off. There's Wednesday. And you just kind of strung those days together. Having the successful summer also gave us a chance to even be in school. And I don't think that can be understated. So I think it was very, very successful from that standpoint. Once August came around, then it was a matter of sitting down again with, with all the coaches, myself, Dr. Dexter, and said, okay, what can, how are we going to get these kids now onto the fields? How are we going to get them to softball? How are we going to get them volleyball, uh, cross country, football, the whole works? And she asked me to, to put together kind of a uh, template of what all these kids at every sport, what can we do? So I did that, and I was I was very impressed of of being of her asking me to do that. But then I sat down and put every sport together of when they should be wearing their masks, social distancing, all that good stuff. Gave it to her, and uh, she re reread it, rephrased a few things, da da da. Uh, but then we were a go. And there was times I think we had better practices because they knew, like, hey, we walk off the field tonight. This might be it. Over time, it started getting good until we actually all finally got into bigger groups, until we all actually got into a team, and then that's where it all kind of felt normal. Not knowing whether we were going to have a season was tough already, and having the pressure from the last class, that was also really tough. Not all of us have really played together at the varsity level. Um, there was definitely going to be a little bit of lack in chemistry. Not necessarily comparing ourselves, just feeling that pressure of our senior year and everything with COVID on top of it. We were just all like kind of like all over the place and we had to try to come together. We knew that we were losing a lot of guys and people were going to underestimate us. So we decided that we were either going to have to find a way to get back to where we were, or make our own way if there wasn't one. They lost Caleb, they lost Carson, they lost Brock. They don't have any playmakers anymore. We wanted, we wanted to prove them wrong. We put in so much work that we just don't know if, if it's going to pay out or if it was even worth doing. But, you know, we all stayed committed. That first week of practice went way better than any of us expected. We thought we'd be out of sync, but with those Zoom calls and being able to go over film and the playbook so much, it really didn't miss a step. Out of them and then you kind of have a little empathy because you know these kids should have been able to ideally just focus everything on what every year does you know playing football and going to school and, and eating and just kind of having a good time and they had to focus on cleaning equipment and wearing masks and going on rotations and, and they did a great job of it they did more more than could have been asked and that's just how it goes sometimes they're amazing as far as um, just to season, season the day. There's a lot of positive things that came out of this too, as far as uh, being able to appreciate everything you do and all the moments you have with your teammates and, and all the good times you have because, you know, sometimes we take a lot of things for granted. I mean, gratitude is a word that I would use over and over again. It's just, you know, you grow up and starving kids in Africa eat your food and you know be grateful for what you've got and we say it but we we don't really have that relativity until, until you don't have it and when you don't have it and it's taken away from you when you get it back you you have a different attitude you, you know your, your why is a little more etched in stone
on, boys. Hey, find a way. Make a way. We were feeling like we were a team again and getting prepared for Carney, and then we got shut down. Those two weeks were almost like, of course, par for the course. What else you got? Keep bringing it. <laughs> you know, when we were told uh, we weren't going to be able to play, you know, the first game, and we had to, just, you know, shut down for a couple weeks. I mean, obviously, it was it was pretty devastating. The quarantine was a punch in the gut, and I would say the kids maybe handled it better than me. I didn't handle it very good because I didn't think it was warranted. So that's just the way it is, and uh, they they inspired me to keep going and to keep our coaches going. And they reminded me why I'm even in this, which is to work with them and help help them be successful. We were obviously disappointed about the Kearney game. We've always started with Kearney. That's the one game every year that everybody wants to play. It was really disappointing. I mean, like, especially it being a home game here, first game at the new stadium. Then it turns out that it got moved to the end of the year at Kearney, and then again, got canceled finally, so. Kind of upsetting because all those years, you always, it's a rivalry game. Everybody gets to play him. You look forward to that game, and then you come up to it and you don't get to play him. We weren't happy with it. It is what it is. I mean, um, a lot of the decisions that happened, we don't really know what the, the discussion was around making the decision. It just, the decisions just happened. All you can do is respond. When things aren't, you can't control certain things. You do everything you can to control it, but there's a point where things sometimes are not in your control and you go from there and just take on the next challenge. We just had to stay focused, keep, uh, keep doing our Zooms and stay locked in and still work out. And That was tough. Like I'd never, obviously, that's new for all of us, um, not really being able to go out uh, to the home workouts and stuff like that, not being able to see my teammates, my friends. We did a lot of Zooms and we knew the Zooms, they, didn't, they weren't for football in the sense of like, oh, now we're so much better at football because we, I mean, it's like me teaching my class on a Zoom. It doesn't really do a lot. It's about keeping connections, about seeing faces, about letting kids know that we're still together in this. It was just a struggle for everybody, I would assume just as much as myself. With Coach T doing senior night, the first game, definitely felt a little weird and gave you a little bit of a doubt that we might not have a full season. I was so thrilled to be able to, to play. I mean, that's why, you know, another unpredictable, you know, and just unorthodox thing is senior night, game one. So we wanna, I wanted to make sure we honored our seniors because I couldn't guarantee we'd, you know, are we gonna get back to another home game? We just weren't sure all season if we were going to have a season. Even up until that game, we just weren't sure if it was going to be there or not. And I think the biggest thing, especially that first game, was like, we made it. We got a game. We got a game. Because it really, at that time, you know, we didn't think we were going to play football. And we knew, hey, at least these seniors got one game. Because obviously you always want to open up, get a good start to the year with a win, especially in the new stadium. Our locker room is beautiful. We're very grateful but it wasn't in our comfort zone. We have no history here. We're trying to make history here, but where do I sit? Where's, where's my place? What's my routine gonna be? There was definitely pressure on um, making sure we represented our new stadium the right way. We didn't wanna open the stadium up with a loss. We knew we had to win and win with confidence. Especially with the tradition that we got and stuff here. You always wanna go out and do your best and start it off right. It took a while to get here, thanks to some unexpected curves and collisions with the COVID pandemic. Perseverance paid off. It's opening night for Islanders football. This is Brian Gallagher along with Dan Thayer as the KRGI Sports Network presents high school football. We're at Grand Ellens Memorial Stadium where the Islanders will battle the Thunderbolts of Lincoln Pius X. We were here for the kids to play and they fought for that opportunity and they trained for that opportunity. And I was very nervous and we only had like eight days of practice. We literally cracked our knuckles and played ball. There was, I mean, the scrimmages, um, 
all the stuff we normally do leading up to it. And even when we do all those things, the first game's usually pretty rocky anyway. Anytime you have an interruption of any length of time, rust will set in. There were a lot of rough edges. There was a lot of rust and rough edges. I think that the coaches did everything they could to try to keep the kids on track. When you can't really have an organized situation, that's tough. We were definitely not ready to really play anybody, but we had to play and we did, so. Dalen had to take it upon himself, which he did, knowing that it was going to hurt, knowing it was going to be uncomfortable for him, but yet he, he rose to that level of his pain tolerance, knowing that he, he, for his brothers, he got out there and did it. I mean, I, you see a kid who plays on a broken foot, and he just, he brought everything he had every game. It's pretty inspiring to watch him. And he probably played at least four to five weeks on a broken foot. Uh, there, ain't, there aren't too many high school kids, let alone NFL players, that want to play on, on a broken foot. Pain's temporary, so. You're used to Carney, so that was awkward. Honestly, that's what kind of threw me for a loop, is just we weren't playing Carney. And then there's just little stuff that you, I wouldn't have thought of, like how quiet it was. Like it was, you know, it was quiet. You could hear everything. There just wasn't that usual noise. Still plenty of social distancing going on, and as has become a rather public knowledge and public issue for those outside of Grand Island, there are no visiting fans allowed inside the stadium due to concerns about mixing. We'll not talk more about that. They're doing all the talking on the east side of the state. We're excited, but then it felt weird too because we were like so used to all the all the fans there and that was the weirdest part about all of it I've said that so many times before just amongst all of us going towards the school we'd look to our right and see like the hell there's nobody there and then looking to the left at our fans and there's like 50 people there it was so quiet you could hear yourself whisper it was not the same it was bad yeah that was weird not having those visiting fans to feed off that energy not hearing that roar in the crowd when obviously right before kickoff and when we're streaking down the field about to score a touchdown, first downs, all of it, it was just something different. I just thought it was cool. Even though there's still no fans, I just still thought it was cool to still be playing in the new stadium and that we actually had a chance to actually play. It's what we've been waiting for for months and months and months. And I couldn't ask, I'd, I'd go to hell and back with you guys. I'd go to freaking hell and back with you guys wherever you want to go. I've never had a team take ownership like this team. You've got to continue it, but I've never seen it, anything like it. Guy, you, you are a special bunch. You are a special bunch. And we got to do, we do this together, we're going to be pretty damn hard to beat. Guy, you're going to have to have the best game you ever played to beat the Islanders, because we ain't going to beat ourselves. And we have unmatched chemistry. When it gets too tough for them, it's just right for us. That's just right where we want to be, man. Guy, last thing, be who we are. We got some new digs. We're grateful. This is a beautiful place. But we're still about rust and dings and scratches and freaking dirt. That's what we're about. We're about that old beat-up lunch pail that's been around for freaking 20 years. That's what we're about. So the new, new paint job doesn't change who we are right here. Guy, blue collar. Blue collar, hard nose, GI tough. That's who we are, and that's how we're going to play, okay? And that's how we're going to play for 48 minutes, for 48 years, whatever it takes. 48 overtimes, I don't care, okay? Be who we are. All right, we've seen the Jeff Tomlin way of doing things with Islanders football firmly entrenched now. You just have expectations about execution. You have expectations about dedication. Now, there was the setback this year because of the COVID positive tests that ended up forcing a postponement of their week one game and seeing that game rescheduled and then moved to Kearney besides. But what you have here is some eager anticipation with some guys that very honestly look athletic. They play athletic. And I know that Jeff Tomlin is expecting them to show their athleticism and take advantage of it to get a home win. I definitely feel like we needed to get off to a, a hot start, especially after not playing that first week while everyone else in the state already had a game under their belt. And I just felt like we needed to get that win. Week one, you know, nobody knows what they got. 
um, you just you're really not playing football yet. It's just you're honestly it felt like a scrimmage in a lot of ways. But it was almost like in starting from from point C, we were starting from point B as far as because we just didn't quite have the time and the reps. Obviously, between the lines was the best part because nothing really changed there. And so that part was nice. It was really refreshing for, for those couple of hours to, from the start of the first quarter to the end of the game, it was normal. It was just, life was normal for a while. I work them. Every snap, with the damn snap, narrow it down to the least common denominator. I'm kicking this snap. I'm winning this snap. That's out of my mind. Next snap, I'm winning. Don't bite off the whole chunk. Take a little bite at a time and win that, okay? And lastly, be who we are. Be who we are. We're blue collar. That's our identity, okay? We're rust and dents and dings and scratches. We're dirt, okay? We come from the dirt. That's where we scrape our living out, right? Just like I said pregame or pre before pregame, okay? The new paint job, the new digs are great. But it's what's inside that, that matters. And it's still the old rusty pickup. Okay? But it runs like a champ. Okay? It runs like a champ. Bring it in here, take a knee. Now, what do the Islanders need to do? They need to show some consistency. They just need to come out, not try to overdo things, but whatever they do, they just need to do it well. This is where conditioning plays such a big part. It's a nice evening. It's not burning hot, but it is warm out here. Guys that are in the backup role are gonna have to be ready because you have guys that cramp up always in the first game. So depth is going to be important. Conditioning is huge, Brian. We didn't want to be the, the team that like, you know, we come in, it's a crappy season. And everyone's like, oh yeah, the first season here really sucked. Welcome back to Grand Allen's Memorial Stadium. The all new, redone, beautifully Jack Martin Field. Dan, we, this is our first chance to participate in the new, well, we'll call it the Skybox. What a setup, what a facility. Beautiful job that they did. And we have the field that's new and painted. And the Skybox, or, or press box rather, is really beautifully done. The pledge was to make this once again the best high school stadium in all of Nebraska. And I think they've met that goal. Islanders will head south as we get things going. Soccer style kick will get into the end zone. That'll be a touchback and the Islanders will start this first series at the 20 yard line. Like at the beginning, I thought our offense was kind of missing at times, like timing with receivers and quarterbacks wasn't completely on. And then our defense, we weren't communicating as well as we could and we weren't like easy things we should be able to stop. We weren't stopping them like we could in practice. That's the whole deal about we didn't have all that time to practice and really have that come together as a team. Time, our timing was all off. We were all just a little bit off. Minute 56 left to play, first quarter. Grand Allen nothing, Lincoln Pius the 10th nothing. Tries to lay it up over the top, that pass is short, but it's a catch! Cam Aiden went right over the top of the D-back. He went up a little too soon. And Aiden makes the catch and gets it all the way down to the Pius 26 yard line. The big pass, setting up the first down, looking for the end zone. has got a man there. Yes, he did. Touchdown, Islanders. 25 yards on the completion. Braxton Mendez will try the PAT. Jurgens Meyer to hold. The kick is up, and it's good. And the Islanders have taken the lead. 25-yard touchdown reception by Brandon Fox has put Grant Allen out in front. It took four plays to get the score. Islanders lead it seven to nothing. This is Islanders football on the KRGI Sports Network. Really, in hindsight, that was good football. And if you really look at what we were able to do leading up to that moment in terms of no spring, limited summer, um, essentially no weights for you know a quarter of a year. Honestly, we weren't very like together as a team. We were very sluggish. We were all like yelling at each other, getting like on somebody. At the time, yeah, you're upset. You're like, God, what's going on? And then you look back and you're like, this is probably really good football for what we 
what we've had time to get these kids ready to do. During halftime, Coach T kind of just came out and told us, you know what, we've been here before, we know what we're doing, let's just go play football. Fourth down for the Islanders, Jurgens Meyer fakes the rugby punt, runs, uh, throws it off the left side, pass complete, and that is the threat that Jurgens Meyer brings to them in the backfield. And that pass was on the money to Drew Hofeld. What a beautiful play. Fourth down gamble pays off for the Islanders with a huge first down. So I heard the call come in and I was like, oh, here's, here it's big time, Hofeld, let's, let's go. You know, Coach T was ready to, he, he called it and we ran it and the kids picked it up. Yeah, the, the true story is that Coach Cloutier and the kids on the punt team deserve all the credit for that call. I simply said, go ahead. It was kind of a ballsy move, especially first game of the year. I mean, you're, you're showing that play to everyone, you know, so you're just throwing it out there, but we needed the momentum. You know, the play was nice and that's always fun. What I think I remember the most is like, there was suddenly like this electricity. We weren't really doing a whole lot. Like we weren't throwing a whole lot of punches at them. We weren't landing anything. And then we kind of hit that. We're like, okay, we know what we're doing. This isn't too big of a deal. Let's get into our groove and get working. And all of a sudden, from that point on, it was, you know, like a movie montage almost where, okay, now we're awake, let's play ball. On the draw play, Kellebone dives inside the five, gets knocked down at the one. Kellebone pushing the pile. He's in there. Touchdown, Islander. Pass complete. Right side, here's some running room. Cam Aiden weaves his way through traffic and moves it ahead to the 24-yard line. This will be a 41-yard field goal try. It's got the length. It did it stay true. It did! 41 yards! Braxton Mendez hits for the Islanders, and they extend their lead. Place to go, the Islanders run him down. A tremendous outside pursuit for the Islanders. Braxton Mendez exploded over from his linebacker spot. Give it off to Vodichka and he's planted. No chance, and he got buried. He dumps over the middle, it's intercepted. The Islanders smelled it tackle. Has some running room up the right side into Pius territory. Kirk Finally over the middle's got a man. He is going to go! Marcus! Hauling on the slant route, 60 yards, touchdown, Grand Island. And Grand Island reopens Memorial Stadium, Jack Martin Field with a victory. They turn back Lincoln Pius the 10th by a final score of 24 to seven. Loved our effort. We got a lot of rough edges we got to polish. I'll take that effort all day long. Fantastic job. Really, really proud of you. We were fortunate enough to get a win in our first game uh, against Pius, and um, we were happy because we got the win. We didn't sit down in the coach's office after the game and say we played great. We definitely could have played better, but for as little time as we had before that game, it was about as prepared as we were going to get. It was a win, but it wasn't pretty. Hold the rope. Guy, and don't let that go. Hold that sucker for all it's worth. Play for the guy on the right or the left. And don't forget how grateful we've got to be to be able to play football. When so many kids around the country, they can't do it. Okay? And you don't know when. We never, we never know when the last one is. You better spend every bullet in the clip, right? You better put everything you got out there and let it live. Take a knee. That's a team right We played Papillion last year and, and honestly played one of the worst games I've ever been a part of. Win, so everyone's happy outside, but we're like, no, 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 no. Well, Southeast wasn't the type of team you could play poorly against and really even be in the game, much less beat them. It's the nature of sports. Sometimes you do show up and the other guy lands a punch and it's fight over. Our margin of error on offense was, was a lot thinner. Uh, we didn't have just, we didn't have the same caliber of playmakers. We got off to a real rough start. Couldn't afford penalties and turnovers in particular. I think the first three possessions were three turnovers. Third down and one coming up here for the Islanders. Jurgensmeyer fakes it, toss play, Fife bobbles it, dies for the football. 
Loose ball is going to be recovered by Southeast. We are a program that relies more than any other program in the state on executing at the highest efficiency possible. It's not the kind of start you want to have against one of the best teams in the state. And that seemed to plague us, you know, throughout the, the very first half of the season. Jurgens Meyer throws over the top, passes intercepted, that ball sailed. And getting the pick for Southeast was free safety Derek Branch. Two turnovers by the Islanders here in the going and Southeast in Islanders territory. When things go wrong, kids don't trust their training. And I think that's another example of where we rely on the offseason so much. You don't rep it till you get it right. You rep it till you can't get it wrong. We were nowhere near that really all year. And, and I think that that costs us. Third down and 10 for the Islanders. Jurgens Meyer to throw. Looks over the middle. Mm. That's uh, take Mahu. Pass overthrown. Another interception. And the Islanders, in three possessions, have turned it over three times. And Southeast will again start this drive in Islanders territory at the 44-yard line. It's one where you just kind of hang on and try to make sure the kids are fighting because, I mean, we blinked and it was like, how did this get out of hand so quickly? Um, these guys are not this much better than us. We just tried to battle through the whole way and not the result that we wanted. Very disappointing, very disheartening for for our kids. After a tough loss like that, there's only one way to go and that's a wake up call for our whole program and our coaches and and uh, just back to the drawing board. It just didn't seem like we were all ready to go and all locked in. We didn't hammer out the details that we should have. We put more attention to detail. We needed more bonding because it was still a little off and we needed more energy and tempo. We need to sweat the details or we're not really getting anything out of it. And you just got to wake up Saturday morning, you got to watch the film, and you just got to have the mentality to just come out next week and put on a pounding. Uh, at the end of the day, these are, these are high school kids. Um, we see grown men do this on Sunday sometimes. There's a lot of, a lot of good lessons to take from that. Um, obviously, the efforts there, I thought we fought hard all the way through, all the way to the end. Okay? We've got to get, obviously, way better fundamentally. We got whooped on some fundamental stuff. Okay, and part of that's youth a little bit, kind of getting getting our nose slapped a little bit by my guys, maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. And then part of it's just hunkering down and making sure we we do our fundamentals correctly, right? But uh, we, you know, the efforts there, guys. The efforts there. That's the foundation we build on, right? And the coachability's there when you play a real good team, and they are a very good team. Hell, we may see them later again. Then, then uh, we can't afford, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot mistake type things, but we all wear that. We all wear that. They're all our mistakes as a team, okay? But I bet they, there's a lot of good stuff to build off of that. There's a lot of good stuff that we can build. Uh, we're gonna face a good opponent next week. He's off to a really good start, so we're gonna, we're gonna have to make a jump. Yeah, that was our worst game of the year as far as our, how we played, in it, which it was. Um, and we built from there. We knew Fremont would be a, a, a big challenge for us. They had some tremendous athletes, a lot of speed. They have probably the best team they've had in a decade. We knew they would be hard to contain, you know, with their offense. Very good running back. Uh, selling kids a quality receiver. Their quarterback impressed me. Big line. And, you know, our offense, we were still in the process of finding ourselves a little bit. I had that ready to go feeling. Um, we were there and we wanted to be there and we knew what we were doing. It's time to go to work and be who we are, okay? Key number two, besides starting strong, we gotta, we gotta go out, which means exceed the standard, right? In everything, exceed the standard in everything. Everything, every snap, every position, we gotta exceed the standard, okay? Exceed the standard. You're part of something really special, so you gotta feel the obligation to earn that every time you go out, okay? Every time you go out. Oh, lineman, you're going to earn it for Riley Perlikowski and dudes like that. Okay, that busted their ass every snap. They okay, might not have been the talented, but they, they freaking most talented. Them are tough. And every play, every play they went left. Okay, so that's who we're fighting for. Guys from our past and guys, guys that you're going to turn the program over to. All right? 
Fremont is a team with a high-powered offense, so Grand Island cannot afford a repeat performance. And Fremont has watched the film of last week, and they know that Southeast got on Grand Island very, very quickly. Fremont, one of their keys tonight is to get off to a quick start against Grand Island. And in their three games, a 2-1 and one record, and they're averaging nearly 35 points per game. The game they lost at North Platte was a 35-31 setback. So these guys are going to race up and down the field as often as they can. How does Grand Island react tonight? They got kicked. And even when they were down, they got kicked a little bit last week. How do young men respond to that type of adversity? We'll see very shortly. We start out the game, you know, eight yards a pop. 10 yards a pop. Give it off to Keolavone. We're looking for some blocking up front. Has a seam. Got to the edge and blasted his way across the 20. Grand Allen football at the 44. Jurgensmeyer wants to throw. Throws it underneath. Pass complete. Caught at the 16. He'll stretch it ahead to the 15 yard line. Cam Aiden. Spot the football back at the 10. Jurgens Meyer to throw. Looking for the corners. Got a man in the area. That's a Teak Bahu. Catches it. He elevates above the defensive back and hauls it in for the touchdown. So the Islanders, after forcing the punt, are able to march it back down the field and get the score. Braxton Mendez to try to add the PAT. Good snap. The kick is up and it's no good. It drifts right. A 16 play, 93 yard drive, and the Islanders are able to get on the board. The offense, they moved the ball, they got first downs, they, they got some field position stuff going. Defense made some plays, got us off the field. Jurgensmeyer is uh, the punter as well, kicks a little pooch punt. It's going to roll down inside the one yard line. So Fremont now 99 yards away from a score at the other end third and long, deep in their own territory that they converted. Syntec, draw play. That's Moore, Get him fighting, down. pushing. Oh boy, he moved that pile a long way. I don't know. It looks like he's going to be marked at the 11, and they said that is enough, and that is just pure fight from Micah Moore. One of the worst parts is like they were on their own 10 or something like that, and they ran a ball up the middle off the tackle and went all the way down for a touchdown. It was really frustrating. Six carries, 36 yards, and a huge conversion, the first third down conversion of the night. Here's Moore in a drop play, and they are not going to catch him. He's getting faster as he goes to the end zone. Touchdown, Fremont. That script's always flipped. That's not Islander football. Again, we messed up some fundamentals at all three levels. I mean, D-line, linebacking core, secondary, and the kid just went right up the pipe. Islanders threatening here with 25 seconds left to play in the first half. Second down and 10 for the Islanders from the 11. Wideouts each side. Jurgensmeyer, plenty of time. Now looking over the middle. Oh. That's in intercepted. He got sucked into it. The middle linebacker, Caden Thompson, had the coverage. It looked like Chrisman was waiting about the two yard line. There's a flag down. At the 10. Turnovers plague us. And in, in tight games, that's going to be the, the difference. And, and the thing I remember most about Fremont is seven holding penalties. Penalties. Penalties are killing us. Get a first down, get another first down, then we would get a penalty. We were all pretty upset about it because it seemed like whatever we did, it was holding. But Coach Cunningham calmed us all down, told us just keep doing it how we're doing. We're doing everything fine. Just work as hard as we can. That next week. We worked on our holding calls, and Coach C made us feel it. Later down the stretch, it was really close. We were within a few points of each other. Still second down and really long here in the fourth quarter. Islanders down by eight. Trips to the right side for the Islanders. Jurgensmeyer steps up. Got a man in the middle. It's a Teak Bahu. The catch inside the five, down to the four-yard line. First down and goal just inside the four-yard line. Clock is moving with a minute 46 left to play in the Second fourth. Islanders trailing 14-6. They need a touchdown plus a two-point conversion here. Jurgensmeyer fakes it, fires it. Caught! Touchdown, Islanders! Little drag around right side. Was able to throw it in underneath. And that was Keolavon that made the catch for the score. Play broke down. Ended up rolling out to the right and was running out of room, so I just 
stuck it in there, hope Dalen could catch it, and he did. It didn't surprise me at all, because I know Jaden, he's a great kid. And I think you just saw a moment of heart. You saw a moment where a kid was just busting his butt for his team and doing what he had done the whole game. Work as hard as he could to the best of his abilities, but the heart was always there, and it was just nice to finally get the payoff from the fight that you had seen for, for really the first 12 quarters of the season. All right, here comes the try for two. Fife goes in motion, right and then back to the left side. Jurgensmeyer looking, lobs for the corner, dive, caught! Two point conversion is good! Oh my goodness. We had a phenomenal series down there on the goal line uh, with two incredible catches by Dalen to, to put us back in. Hey, we're in, we're in another overtime here. Islanders quickly to the line. Fife is the running back. Kielavone lines up as a slot back to the right side. Toss play right side for Fife. Looks for blockers. Looks for room. Dives down to the two-yard line. Fife comes out. Chrisman is in. The diamond set behind Jurgensmeyer And second down a goal from the two. Jurgensmeyer keeps. Dives. He's in there. Touchdown, Islanders. They took advantage of, of you know, our lack of discipline at times. But still, at the end of the game, you know, we were somehow in a position of what I'd call steal it. 21-14, Islanders lead it in overtime. Second down a goal from the one. In overtime, Islanders lead 21-14. Give it to Moore. He'll jump off left side, and he's in there. Now the question becomes, do they kick or do they try for two here? They're thinking two. They call the perfect play at the perfect time against the absolute uh, pressure that I called. The only guy that could have covered the quarterback was on a blitz. Jackson was on a blitz, he went in, and he handed it off, went the other way, and I feel like if I would have triggered a second earlier, I probably could have got him, which really was really frustrating for me because I kind of felt like that was on me. Moore lines up as a slot man to the left side. Syntec. Brings the motion man back towards the middle of the formation. Little double reverse throw to Syntec. Gonna die for the corner and he got in there. With the two point conversion, Fremont survives in overtime. They turn back the Islanders by a final score of 22 to 21. Nothing Ben can do about it and I went and I did as, like, as good as I could and he did what he was supposed to. Like if I hadn't been on the blitz, I would be there to cover the guy that caught the ball, but it's just the situation they had us in the perfect storm. Credit them for the perfect call at the perfect time, but devastating loss, and we could only point our fingers inward. We didn't take care of the football, didn't take care of details. Uh, we're not a cohesive team at that point. I don't know if we trusted each other. But we continue to beat ourselves. And that's, that we're, our, we're our biggest opponent right now. We're, we're our own worst opponent right now. So we got to conquer ourselves, and we'll figure out the rest of it. Because the effort's there, the toughness is there, all that stuff's there, okay? But now's the time when you got to circle the wagons, okay? We're out, we're out, and everybody's, everybody's shooting arrows at us now. Now you got to circle the wagons and stay together, okay? Because anybody can freaking say, oh, hell with you. Give up on this thing. That ain't, what, that ain't us. But then it was like there's some people like we just lost to Fremont who's not supposed to be a very great team. We're going in against the best team in the state. We're outmanned by everyone we're going to play and it's just kind of hopeless at this point. There was some negativity on the team at, at one point where people were saying like we don't really have a chance. When I saw the lack of motivation, the people that were kind of this isn't going anywhere, just kind of either like telling them to get with it or get out. You come along and follow with us or you leave because at that point you're just holding us back. We had a new strength coach. He did things differently than what Coach Swanson used to do, Coach Williams, so we were adjusting to changes in the weight room as well. Because we all felt it. We all felt something was off in the weight room. We, every, the practice was right. Everything else was right. Just something about the weight room felt off. And us seniors, we talked about it as a whole. We're like, if we all want to progress, we have to get our weight room back. We did come apart in the weight room quite a bit. We had it so low that we didn't even realize we were down there. We didn't have like the energy. 
we need to get our weight room back. It's, it's not where it needs to be. We need to not let anything outside take it over. It's our, that's our place we prepare to go to battle with other teams. You can tell on the field when we had a couple lousy weeks up in the weight room that it showed on the field. The problem was that we were messing around and not being focused on building ourselves. We talked about it as a group of detailers and with Daylon as the captain, and we decided that it wasn't going to go like that anymore. You just kind of got to single those people out. You can't let them drag anyone else down. You got to be like, you got to tell them straight up, it's like, you're going to join us or you're going to have to get out of here because we're not going to have any of that negativity. We're believing in what we're doing here. I think it it, it kind of changed because we had Swanson and then we had Williams, and we really liked them. And I felt like when Swanson left, he left a lot behind, and we just had to follow that. You gotta realize that you're not gonna be the biggest guy out there, so you gotta realize that you gotta work harder than everyone else. Doing with the great leaders that came through this uh, program before, just trying to do what they do. We're in here training for war. So we had to make a change. You're not talking to people unless it's something that needs to be said. We really got that weight room back to where it should have been to begin with. We need that because Following that tradition is what's gonna what's gonna work the best. Semper Fi, what's it mean? Always faithful. Four core values: honor, courage, commitment, loyalty. We talked all week about hold fast is an old nautical term, and basically it meant uh, for the ship's crew when when the seas get rough, hold on to something that's gonna last that you can count on. We talked about hey, it's been rough, but we're still playing. You know, the pandemic hasn't shut us down yet, or the powers that be haven't shut us down yet, so let's keep going. And we have to hold fast and we have to stay true. The, the seas are not gonna get any less rough. Their, their chances are in this game, they're gonna get even rougher. And so I think what Coach asked of all of us is, do we really believe in our core tenets? Do we really believe in the foundation that we're basing not the program on, our lives on? those virtues. It starts with just showing up. Then it starts with giving great effort, having the correct attitude, being disciplined, team uni. I mean, we've got it on the walls. Are we willing to hold fast to that? Are we willing to stay true to the virtues that we're all choosing to base our lives on? What better time to do it than a week against the best team in the state? By far, one of the best teams in the last decade. That's a great time to really test your, your mettle um, and without a doubt, that was one of the, it was the best we could practice up until that point all year, not even close. The West Side game was a lot of, it was a learning experience. We could have beat them 42-0 and we still would have learned. Third loss in a row. And you know, I know there was a couple teammates that were saying, you know, oh well, God, we suck, we can't even win a game. There's no room for negative talk when it comes to our team. Back to Coach T's motto, got to hold fast to the program and got to stay true to ourselves. You have to have a good mindset going into every game. I think everyone's intensity was ramped up even more because we were all mad. We didn't want to lose like that ever again. We didn't want to lose anymore. When we're going through stuff like that, I mean, we need to stay close. It got easier than ever to stay just six inches in front of your nose because there, there was no other option. It was going to be a complete collapse or we were going to make something out of this in terms of getting some results. Post game, we get that talk and it was tough. We knew that we had a lot of work that we needed to do if we wanted to get where we wanted to get. The biggest thing, like we talked about all week, okay? Hold fast, stay true. Hold fast, stay true. Because it's pretty easy. Now it's really rocking, right? Now the freaking waves are coming over the edge. And that's when the me guys jump off the ship, try to find another ride. We need the guys that are going to hold tight. Hold fast, right? And stay true the whole time. And I think we got them. I think we got them. I know we got them. But it's going to take a lot of courage. Okay? It's going to take a lot of courage and a lot of guts to keep getting better. Just to keep lining up, keep getting better. That's the guys we got. Okay? I'm totally a believer. I'm totally confident in that. It was fun to be a part of it. Really, it was. Because watching those kids, and it was the kids, take ownership and get some buy-in going. Um, it was it was fun to see it. I'm always proud of you. Always proud of you. I always love you. Break it down. At the end of this game, we have to be able to say, 
we got better regardless of the outcome. There was kind of that feeling, well, I guess we're going to respond. I guess we're going to maybe push all our chips in the middle because this kind of tone the water stuff wasn't working. I personally took it to heart. I started working a little bit harder from that point. I just put in a little bit more. And I, I think I can say the same for all of my teammates because from that point on, I just felt like there was a little bit more click, a little bit more energy. We all just had that fire. that was supposed to be a home game that we lost because we wouldn't host visiting fans. We still got on the bus and, and got there and and I give our, our seniors credit. They, they did a whale of a job. Offensive line kind of came of age. Uh, Dalen took over that game. From the nose position, he took over that game. Yeah, something, something clicked with all of us. Yellowbone barrels over a would-be tackler and gets it ahead to the 31. And off goes up the middle. That's Yellowbone broke a tackle. He's headed for the end zone. Touchdown, Grand Island. Colette wants the corner ripped off his feet, and that was Kitan fighting. Rolling right, Fitzpatrick throws underneath. Intercepted. That's fight. That saw it coming. Has some running room. It's a foot race to the other end. Fife gets away, he's gonna go! Touchdown, Islanders! Once we started coming together and stuff, and we were all playing fast, we I had a feeling just like, I believe in my guys right now. Islanders trailing 20 to 14, we're just underway in the third quarter. Islanders will go with the rugby kick from about the 35-yard line. Ball bobbled for a moment, but then recovered by the Titans. The return will come back out to the 45. Islanders scrambling like there's a loose ball. They're pointing the other way. No indication yet from the officials. The Islanders do get it back. That ball did come loose, and the Islanders have recovered. We recovered it, and we were all pumped up, and the ref said, no, it's not a fumble. And as coaches, it wasn't that big of a deal because, you know, but the kids, for some reason, they were salty. And a bunch of the seniors were like, it was almost like they had had enough. The call was overturned. Would have pissed anyone else off, honestly. Oh, 100%, yeah, we were, we were pissed for sure. You expect there to be some home field advantage with the calls, like a little bit of a misholding call here or there. They call something that wasn't there. The refs kind of screwed us over on that one. You know, our offense was out there, we're already setting the ball. And then they switched it around. Nah, we're overturning it. It's not your ball anymore. That was our ball. <laughs> that was our ball. We had the ball, it was very clear, and then it was like, yeah, sorry guys, we're actually gonna give it to them. So I said, I'm not moving. You can't just make the call that we're gonna go out on offense and then they're just gonna flip it. I said, I'm not leaving until Coach G tells me to go off because that was our ball. In my mind, I was like, all right, we're gonna go out there and then the whole demeanor is gonna be like, all right. <laughs> I'm done with all this crap. You can sugarcoat it however you want, there's a terrible call. They were pissed. I think that really upset our kids. And I'm telling you, from that point on, I'm talking for pretty much till the rest of the year. We decided to play. The pads popped just a little bit differently. And uh, play we did. Offense, defense, across the board, there was just a sound that on the sideline, on the field, that that was kind of the last missing piece. 
Gives it off in the middle. Nowhere to go for Colette. Kielavon, again, just blew up that play. Third and 13 here. Chance for the Islander D to step up. Fitzpatrick, straight drop, trying to throw the screen, intercepted! Augustine Atikmahu, he's gonna go! Beautiful play by Augie. Screen was set up, as you noted, and Augie was lurking off to the right side of the defense. The play was screen on left side, and Augie jumped up, made an athletic play, caught the ball on the jump and then raced back a really nice decision by one of the Islander defenders in what could have been a block in the back on the quarterback. Decided to lay off, but Augie with good speed out races the quarterback to the end zone. Touchdown for a second pick six by G.I. This is one where you rack your brain and try to think, when have you seen two pick sixes in the same game? I can't think of it, but I'm going to enjoy it while I can because that puts the Islanders ahead 21-20. Third down and nine. A chance for the Islanders to perhaps set, set up another takeaway opportunity. Trips to the right side for the Titans. Fitzpatrick drops the throw. Feels pressure. Lobs can't get there. The pressure came up the middle. Dalen Kiolavone planted his bulb right in the wrong spot. Wow, what an effort by Kiolavone up the middle. Kiolavon from his nose guard spot beat the double team and the play was designed to go off right side again with an out route to get that first down yardage quarterback did not get a good delivery on it because he was hit by nose guard Kielavon as he released it the ball fluttered then and fell short of the receiver well, he's going to sleep well on the bus ride home because he's been a terror at the nose guard spot he's also ripping off big yardage from his halfback position Second down and seven. Fitzpatrick toss play right side. Jones wants the edge. Got there. Running room. Foot race down the sideline. 20, 10, 5. Touchdown, Titans. Devin Jones takes it down the sideline for a Titan. Touchdown. And how the mood can change. The Titans come up with an answer of their own. Devin Jones goes 59 yards for the score. And the Titans regain the lead 26-21. 3.27 left to play third quarter. Now Fife running up the middle of the field. Has some running room, showing some speed. Cuts right. 50, 40, pushed out of bounds as he got up to the 35-yard line. We have never had a quarterback in my time here, nor have I ever had a quarterback in my previous years of coaching that played more than a scant passing down or you know was a was a nickel safety or something that played literally every snap and played it at such a high level plays that he made with his feet he had a, he had a great night throwing the ball as well never came off the field Tremendous play at safety. He's our punter now. I mean, he's trying to block punts. It just, what we ask him to do is superhuman, and he was able to do it. And he, he had a really breakout game that game. I had to become more of a, a vocal leader than, than leader by example. So I had to really just keep encouraging the players and everyone around me, keep their head up tell him they got it, coach him through everything. He was so excited to play quarterback. I mean, he was pumped and he showed it. I mean, he played really well. He was a two-way player, actually three-way player with special teams and everything. So he didn't have much time on the sideline for me to talk to him. But whenever I, whenever I had the chance to, I definitely went over to him and gave him some pointers. He plays with an edge. He's really feisty and he's like, he doesn't hold anything back. He's fun to play with. Islanders with the ball inside the 22, call it the 21-yard line. 6.32 left to play in the fourth quarter. Islanders threatening here, but trailing 26-21. Fife wants to throw. Has a man over the middle. It's on the money. Touchdown! Brandon Fox hauls it in from the 19. Touchdown, Islanders. But the Islanders go 46 yards in seven plays and they've taken the lead. 5.28 left to go in the fourth. Islanders 27, Titans 26. 
This is Islanders football on the KRGI Sports Network. Probably the most pivotal game of our season. You know, coming off of three straight losses. We got to get this win. Come on, defense. 2.15 and counting left to go fourth quarter. Islanders up one. Fitzpatrick tosses left side. Jones, left-handed throw over the middle. has got a man in the area. Broken up. Getting over to make the play for the Islanders. Kitan Fife. Big play here. Fourth and four for the Titans. Fitzpatrick, high snap. Looking left. Feeling pressure. Dies forward. Will not get there. No. Oh, boy. They're, they're giving him a big spot oh. forward. Oh, they just signaled first down. You, I think you... Boy. I don't know about that. The referee was not happy with his side judge. Oh, my goodness. Well, they converted. And the way he signaled for the chains to move, the referee was expecting for there to be a placement decision that he would make. Football is at the Anadir 27-yard line with 17 seconds left to go. Toss play, right side. This is Jones. Running room. He's going to do it all by himself. The referee's waving it off. We have holding. holding. Titans. The celebration continues for Papio. They have not seen the referee and the yellow flag down. Greatest flag I've ever seen in my life. That was a good feeling seeing that flag. This is a sigh of relief. So it all comes down to this. It is fourth down anyway. 55-yard attempt for Trent Brim. Should be the final play of the game. Clean snap. The kick is up. It is no good. And the Islanders survive. And the celebration's going on on the other side of the field. Islanders got a good rush on it. Got hands up. The ball fell short and to the left of the goal post. And Grand Island comes out victorious. It was ugly at times, but we held on. It wasn't a pretty execution, but the grit was what we had to see as a coaching staff. Great, great effort. Great gut. Hey, we said we had to have guts. We had guts. Okay, we showed a lot of guts. That's a step forward. That's a big step. Okay, great, great job. Really proud of you. We played all 48, right? Played all 48 as hard as we could. And that's what hanging in there will do for you, right? That's what hanging in there will do for you. Okay? That's the, that's the main thing that we've been trying to teach you, and it'll pay off. Okay? Great job. That's probably the most excited I've seen the guys, you know, after that game. Yeah, that felt like we were, we were turning this ship around. It just felt like we finally got some momentum, knowing that the next four games we play are all 50-50 balls. It really helped our weight room, too, which then again leads back to the field and practice. It really raised the energy of everyone. Our team, we really did come together. We're here. We're going to go get it now. We're ready to go. We know what we're doing. We've got some things going here. We can get this thing turned around. We know how to roll. Two weeks ago, the NSAA announced their 2020 plan for Class A playoffs. Everybody in the pool and play out. That means the postseason begins two weeks from tonight. A matchup with Miller Norris, always a good way to measure your progress. Tonight's games weigh even more as the postseason looms. We're at Buell Stadium in Miller where the Islanders battle the Mustangs of Miller North. Dan Grand Allen had to rally last week to topple the Titans of Papillion the Vista South. A good outing, especially considering they went with a new quarterback in an awkward environment. And they got the win last week, Brian, but the task does not get any easier. Miller North, one of the most physical teams in Class A, always extremely well coached, a rich history of state championships. Grand Island's going to have our hands full tonight. Grand Island comes in with a record of 2-3. and three. Millard North is 1-4, and four, but all of their losses have come to teams that are currently ranked, and so this is a team that the people are saying, wait a minute, we're still a contender, and I can still remember when Millard North came to Grand Island with a sub-500 record about 15 years ago and took them down in the first round of the playoffs. And to give you an idea, if you take a look at their offensive and defensive line, especially their regular five, you're looking at guys that are 280-plus, and this is a high school team. Yeah, up front, we were probably giving up, you know, 75 pounds a guy, in some cases more. That was probably the best our line did all season. I think we had one holding call, 
We came out knowing that they're not going to hold back, so we, we couldn't either. We had to lay everything we had on the field. Two good teams uh, facing off, duking it out. The kids are insistent that they're going to grab this by the scruff of the neck and make it theirs. That North game, we were a whole different team. And they play with honor, courage, commitment, and loyalty for your brothers. That's all that matters. That is all that matters. Okay, you got me? Take a knee. Here we go. You win overtime games in the offseason by, by the detail that you put in it and the grind that you go through. That's when we win. In those close ones, we usually find a way. The kids put so much on the line. You know, we're dogs again. The kids made so many great plays to put ourselves in a position. It was the opposite of the Fremont night. We're not playing well, it's not fun. It's just there was something lacking, and when it was there, and it was like, we're gonna do, this is now, this is the feeling I like having. We are, we are, we are. Yeah. We had a you know great game offensively in that game and had some guys make some big plays for us. So. Younger guys were you know, gaining confidence throughout the year, and that was the point where in the Miller North game, you saw some guys who really who broke out a little bit. The belief the seniors had in those guys, um, the trust in them, you know, it, it showed that they started to feel that confidence that we can go out and make plays. Second down and three. Quaintance hesitates. Got some great blocking off the right side. Cut it back towards the middle. The ball is on the ground, and it looks like the Islanders have come up with it at the 24-yard line. A jarring tackle separated the football, and the Islanders get the first takeaway. So the Islander defense is able to come up with a stop. Had one stop earlier, wiped out by a penalty. This time they get it virtue of a turnover. Islanders setting up a reverse. This is Augie, and he's got some running room. 30. 35, getting ahead to the 40, balls on the ground, oh no, the Mustangs got a hand in there and reached it, pulled it out of there, and they get a takeaway in Islanders territory. First down and 10 for Millard North at the Grand Island, 36, 906, left to play first quarter, no score, but the Mustangs with a big chance here. Toss play, left side, Islanders have it played well, great pursuit, and they're gonna drop him all the way back at the 35 yard line. For the most part, you know what they're going to do. It's a matter of, hey, how are you going to stop it? The game was a battle. German tries the middle, breaks a couple of tackles, still on his feet, breaks away! Ten! Five! Touchdown, Islanders! Aiden, like you said, emerged. He had a breakout game for him offensively, but played really well defensively as well. And Will had some key catches. It was a total team effort. That opens up the middle of the field. Fife was on the run, and there he goes. 45, 50. Fife trying to run that quarterback draw. Is able to beat some tacklers. Cuts it up the middle, gets a block. He's going to go! Touchdown, Islanders! And the Islanders go up two scores. 6.06 left to play in the first half. It's the Islanders 14, Millard North nothing. And guys, you know, just overcoming adversity again and not flinching and against a you know, traditional powerhouse team. Wants to throw, lays it out, it's got a man behind the defense, caught at the 50, 40, 30, 20, goodbye! Brandon Fox, touchdown! It has been a battle here at Buell Stadium in Omaha. Six plays, 55 yards, and the Mustangs back within a score, Grand Allen 21. Miller North 14. McDermott cuts through a couple of blocks, has another first down, still going. My goodness, 
What a play inside for the Alamir, standing him up in his tracks was Michael Maxson. And we have a tie ball game. Grant Allen 21, Millard North 21. Quainton sees the seam, cuts back, gets a good block. 40, 30, 20, 10, 5, touchdown Millard North. That's Augie, broke a tackle. He's got a chance to go. 40, 30, 20, bye-bye, baby. Augie and Tikpahu goes the distance. 72 yards, touchdown Islanders. So the battle continues. We've got some bonus football coming up tonight. So the Islanders will have the ball at the 10-yard line. Two wideouts on each side. Snap to Fife. Has time, looks fade around the corner. Catch made, this time Knuth was there. Touchdown, Islanders. Extra point kick is up and it's good. So the Islanders capitalize on their chance in overtime and now it'll be up to the Mustangs to see if they can't go ahead and make things happen. Third down. Give it off up the middle for Cox and he got there. Jason Cox gets the score on the three-yard touchdown run. Cox, and it looks like they will go ahead and kick. This is to tie the game. So, we play on overtime number two. That makes it 35-35. Third and goal coming up here for the Mustangs. Cox tries the middle, did not get there. Got to the two. On the carry. They're bringing out the kicker. They're not going to go for it on two on the two yard line. Low snap. Boyd's kick still gets up and through. So the Mustangs are able to capitalize on the field goal, and the Islanders with an opportunity as they will have the football here in the second overtime. But you still have to finish it. When you don't get the result. Um, you know, on that same field a couple years back with Millard West, it's it's heartbreaking, but I, you don't feel bad because that's what you want to see. You want to see him play that way. Kitan Fife fakes outside, cuts it back to the inside, and the Mustangs were waiting for him, but he continues to push the pile ahead to the five-yard line. Fife on the keeper. If they make the last play, you tip your hat. Diolavone shifts to the right side. Fife looking to throw. Back to the left. Got a man over there. That's intercepted. That's your ball game. Final score in two overtimes. Millard North 38. Grand Island 35. I'd rather lose a game and play like that than win a game playing the way we had played earlier in the year. That's fun to be a part of that. That's fun to be on the sideline and to see a team play with that sort of energy, passion, heart, commitment to each other. We're getting better. We made another step. Now losing sucks. We can't ever accept it. We're never going to accept it at, at senior high. We're never going to accept losing because that's not our standard. Die. But the effort I saw was incredible. The effort I saw was incredible. That being said, I felt like we were a better team after the Miller North game and we had a chance to come home after being on the road for a while and then uh, doing some special things at home. Getting all the way to week seven, you know, was a blessing. The anxiety is, is a factor all season because they didn't really know how long the season would last. When's the carpet gonna get pulled out from under our feet? So I think they were able to exhale a little bit and they could see that, okay, we're gonna be able to play this thing out on our terms now. Going into that game and, and for the first time in a while, we weren't the dogs. And like I said, we're at home. It was kind of, you kind of had more of that letting the dogs off the leash feel that we took for granted. I took for granted that GI kids are just always going to be ready to go out there and get in a fist fight. And we really apparently aren't. With, when you get COVID and you get a shutdown and you get all these weird situations, it, it can change kids. You know, every week was more and more normal. We keep using that word. The opposing fans, the opposing parents, which you're, you're happy to see. You know, everybody wants to watch their son play. So it definitely felt good having people boo, you know, boo us. And I always liked that. We lost Coach Harvey to quarantine and, 
And uh, Coach Plotz actually, he, he was our play caller for the Norfolk game. And then all the next week, we still didn't have Harv. We had him on game night. And I thought our offensive staff handled it very, very well. Uh, but nonetheless, very uneasy feeling. You know, DJ did a tremendous job, uh, but it's like your, your favorite pair of jeans. You know, Harv and I have been doing this so long, I can't imagine doing it with anybody else. There ain't no more waiting, okay? We can't wait on anything else. It's gotta be right now. Okay, let's play our great best football right now. Bring it in. Starting to feel like we were playing up to our potential or closer to it. Starting to feel our team come together, some cohesiveness, more camaraderie. The possibility of us to have a home playoff game was definitely huge because everybody knows that when you're on your home field, it just hits a little bit different, especially in a playoff game. So we were all just fighting a little bit extra for that. So yeah, it was fun. It was fun to go into a game knowing these guys are ready to whip some butt. We're at Grand Ellis Memorial Stadium where the Albiers host the Panthers of Norfolk. Life wants to throw, here comes pressure, gets the throw away, that's Augie, breaks one tackle, breaks another, stumbles ahead and gets him to the 31, some blocking, spins, first down inside the 30 yard line, down to the 29, the throw, lays it out in the end zone, touchdown, Islanders, Brandon Fox on the receiving end of the score, Islanders leading at 7 to nothing. less than a minute to play here in the first. I felt like our kids came out and played really, really well. We missed Aiden that game uh, with concussion protocol, and that, and that was that was a big breakout for Bo Walker. Oh, I love Bo. Yeah, Bo Jangles, Mr. Bo Jangles. Titan Five throws a strike to Bo Walker. Walker up the left sideline, hauled it in. First down a goal for the Islanders. Give it off up inside. That's Walker. He's in there for the score. Touchdown, Islanders. Rolling left. Islanders sent pressure. Kielovon got up and ripped him away. And there's Augie Atikmahu with a pick. Six. He's going to go. Touchdown, Grand Island. That's the second pick six by Augie this season. 10.33 left to play third quarter. It's Grand Island 21, Norfolk 7. Originally, they were going to wrap up schedule next week. However, because of the altered amount of teams playing this year due to the COVID quarantines and so on, the Class A playoff field will now begin next week. We will get the official determination of who goes where tomorrow. Inside they go, this is Kielobone. Bounces once, bounces twice, still going. Gets it inside the 15, down to the 13 yard line. With down and goal, short yardage. Fight, feeling some pressure, steps up, steps around, dives in the end zone. Touchdown, Grand Island. At Grand Island, you know, we talked about statistically did very well in that first half, but they weren't finishing. It wouldn't surprise me if the coaches emphasized finishing at halftime, and they're certainly doing that in the second half. Grand Island off to a great start in the third quarter. Augie Atikmahu came up and just met Payson Owen and dropped him for no gain, but Augie Atikmahu's had a huge night tonight. Trailing now 28-7, Moore feeling pressure, throws it underneath, that's another interception! That's going to be another pick six! That's Franzel, his second pick six of the year. And the Islanders get another pick six to extend their lead. And we talked about a couple weeks ago how rare that is that we would see two in one game against Papillion La Vista. Well, now we have our second game of two pick sixes. I've never had that happen in a season before, ever. This is Kiolovone. Blasts his way through a couple of tacklers, still going, and gets it ahead to the 35-yard line. They tried to see if they could sneak around the corner, and Michael Maxson says, uh-uh, this is my neighborhood. Time to celebrate here at Grand Isles Memorial Stadium, Jack Martin Field, where the Islanders cap off their regular season with a 34-13 win over Norfolk. We gotta start hanging around only each other, right? Only each other so we don't get shut down like some of these other teams, so we gotta be really smart. Great job, proud of you. Senior, great job. Getting a host was a really good feeling. 
kind of put a weight off of all of our chests. Like, wow, get another home game, you know, at seniors, get to play Pius again, get another great team. So it felt really good. We are, we are, we are. We are. Go 11 on three. One, two, three. Go We knew that this could be it for our seniors. That was tough. I was going to lose those guys. They were going to potentially be done with football forever. So we all poured a little extra into that week, getting prepared. Getting to be on that field, being the first team to you know play in the full stadium. Felt good to end on a high note. The seniors wanted it really bad. I mean, we all wanted it. And knowing that, I think, really pushed us to end the season with a bang. The improvement these guys made um, day to day, you know, it wasn't just week to week and what they had to overcome and what they persevered through, their resiliency, uh, it showed. We were all just really grateful to have made it all the way to week nine and then being able to win the way, way we did on the last game we'd ever play here was really memorable. That was nice to send the seniors out without any regrets, any remorse. Because I think if the season had ended in those first couple of weeks, that would have that would have stuck in their craw. I don't know if I've ever been a part of a team, for obvious reasons, that grew this much in a year. Finishing the way we did, uh, maximizing the things we could control, playing GI football, passing that torch on to the next group of kids, finishing the year, the seniors with their head held high, knowing we did this right, there's no better feeling. And just getting a season. You play for a tradition. You play for those that came before you and those that came after you. You play for each other. You play for your brothers, for my brothers, okay? And we play for our seniors. And don't leave a drop out there, seniors, okay? If we have to carry, I'll carry your ass off the field. You play till you physically can't play anymore because that very well could be 99% chance the last time you compete as an Islander on that field. Won't be the last time you compete as an Islander. But on that field, that's a special, special thing, okay? It's a special place, and we have the, the honor of playing them. So let's honor it with the way we play, okay? Honor it with the way we play, okay? Earn your stripes tonight. Let's have a great night. Cut it loose. Have fun. Have each other's backs play again. All right, bring it in. I'll forever use this bunch as, a, as an example, and, and it's probably not what a lot of people think. What I remember most about this bunch is how I'd be in here at the end of practice and we're battling with the mask and misting and disinfecting all the lockers and I'd have seniors right by me sweeping the, sweeping the locker room. We're, we're sweeping our sheds and picking things up and just so I take the pressure off of Al and our custodial staff, how they did the little things like that, how they're servants, how they serve their teammates. That's the special thing about this group that, that will never show up in any statistics, but I can, I can reference and I can, I can uh, draw attention to the fact these guys did it right. Uh, most talented class that we've ever had to go through, not even close. Um, but highest caliber young men, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm so proud of them. And uh, I remember those things. Uh, and how they served. And they served with honor and integrity, and that's what I'm remember most. It was the kind of storm that I think people need in their lives to maintain that gratitude, that emphasis on focusing on being grateful for what you've got instead of always worrying about what you don't got. And, you know, I look around at our blessings with the, with the stadium, uh, with the field, with the great support from the community, the great people I work with, the great kids we get. 2020, if it's taught me anything this season, is to quit whining about the athletes we don't have, the boosters we don't have, the schedule, the whatever, because, you know, I think I'm guilty of it. I think a lot of people are. That's done. That's done. I am there's just gratitude. You can just write that on my forehead. And um, whenever we go out this spring, <laughs> God willing, if we have it, it'll be like, oh, yeah. Remember last spring when we didn't have this at all? because we were all doing push-ups in our basement. So yeah, it's, it's a great sense of, of being blessed and appreciating what you got when you got it.
loss of activities, loss of relationships, loss of loved ones, loss of normalcy, loss of dreams. It's loss. It was a year of loss. The grief and the mourning that follows loss can crush us. It can strip away our hope and sink us unless we remember who we are and where we have come from. Remembering our identity will allow us to fill the voids left by loss and forge ahead to a new and better day. So who are we? We are Islanders. Our culture embraces storms, the unexpected. We seek out challenges and obstacles. We create storms in practice. We create storms in the weight room. We do this because we know that surviving and overcoming the chaos of a storm is the only way to acquire the skills and the resiliency necessary to win games, and more importantly, to win in life. We are a culture that expects every individual to display character values, work ethic, and a desire to serve others before self. We know that the ability of the individual and the team to overcome obstacles and to navigate through the storms of life will, to a large extent, be determined by their character. Islanders are expected to display honor, courage, commitment, and loyalty 24-7, 365. Our culture demands that we respond rather than react. When the thunder claps, the lightning strikes, and the waves crush over our bow, we remain calm and poised. We respond by outworking the problem and by our attention to detail. We think, we work, and we learn to lean on each other. We are a culture that embraces Eno. It's not about me. Our focus is always on serving and loving the people around us. Meeting the needs of our families and our teammates is always our priority. We willingly set aside our own desires in order to lift up and serve the people around us. Our culture is one of sacrifice and service. Islanders, it is our culture, our character values, our work ethic, our attention to detail, our ability to respond to crisis and our genuine desire to serve and love others before ourselves that sustains us through the storms and challenges of life. It is our culture that allows us to say, no matter how dark the night, how far the fall, always in the fight. Islanders, you are members of a proud tradition. Pick yourselves up, love your teammates, and stand tall and proud as you look to the future and fight for an excellent tomorrow.